Never in the history of Mastery has an indie developer reached out to me personally with the intention of wanting me to review his indie game. Naturally, since this situation has never occurred before, many questions were asked from my side as to gauge both the intent and the content of the game itself. From his side, the developer was well aware with the content that I produce, hence why I was reached out to, and although I was not paid to analyze this game, even though it took me 36 hours just to research, aka play the game from start to finish, I was still given a free Steam key for this game made in 2011, which honestly wasn't necessary since the game was only a dollar to begin with. Either way, this kind gesture was very much appreciated. Chi shift is like being in a romantic relationship. At the start, you're having a good time. You don't notice too many negative aspects about the other person, and overall you're hopeful that it's gonna work out in the end. Down the road, however, you start to become more critical. More is revealed about you both as time progresses, frustrating situations may arise that may need direct attention, and overall you're either more or less hopeful that it's gonna work out in the end. At its base level, this 2.5D platformer had you collecting three orbs to use in a teleporter exit. Starring a main character that looks like Jack from <laughs> Jack and Daxter contains a good concept for a game once you learn the controls, and has tutorials spread throughout the game to learn as you progress. It's one of those puzzle games where you can't figure it out on the first try and have to learn from your mistakes in order to progress further. Overall, it's a fun game with some aspects to criticize. Once you've broken past the barrier of the introduction, the formalities, and meeting the parents, you are now deep in the trenches of this relationship. <laughs> I didn't think that would work. For the most part, life is good and there aren't that many complaints to be had. But that curtain has barely been parted. What is seen through the narrow gap, however, are certain situations that are out of the blue. Some of your own doing and some that are out of your control. These happenstances make your heart skip a Beat. Falling off an edge by jumping since you are not close enough to the other side to reach safety. Pressing the wrong key is instant regret. Using your compass to track down the portal to finish the level, but dying after you achieve all three orbs. All of these gunt-wrenching moments accentuate your heart jumping out of your chest, even when you're only a centimeter from death. Which although brings you a sigh of relief that you don't have to start a level from scratch, it's not a pleasant situation to begin with. In the process of these unfortunate dilemmas, the maps that you traverse are learned over the span of where objectives are, which creates the attempt to get there as one of being very difficult. Of these nine territories, each highlight a different setting, a new form of audible enjoyment, shoot, and integrate a new element that may hinder and or improve your advancement. Naturally, as you advance, more of these differing elements are combined the more you journey onward, which provides you a very natural way to gain game knowledge along your journey, rather than giving you a two inch thick book of all the physics, items, controls, terminology, and boundaries at the very start. Especially since half the battle of learning a new skill is actually putting in the time to do it. Not just reading a bunch of books to think you know a skill. Meaning the best way to learn such a new skill is one step at a time. Which is what G-Shift does very well. At the very beginning of each territory, a computer simulation introduces you to one of the eight elements. Fire, wind, water, that, that, that's only four, there's, there's not eight of, you know. Moving blocks, spawners, killers, pumpers, negators, faders, spinners, and teleporters. Moving blocks are triggered when you activate a switch. Spawners breathe life into invisible blocks once collected. Pumpers switch the gravity in one direction. No, not the band, you hormonal teenage girl. <laughs> Negators lock your shifting abilities, faders are bipolar, spinners act like the cameraman's merry-go-round, and teleporters are like toothbrushes. They don't need an introduction. Directly out of the tutorial opens up to the fields, the first territory. Field levels look like Minecraft blocks, yes, you're not the only one who thought that, and these blocks are a stepping stone to the realization that it's genuinely frustrating. Ah, uh, no. Oh, no, shoot. And I missed the jump again. I don't want to do this for the rest of the stream. What? Ah, <laughs> uh, I thought I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> then I'm gonna drop down. What? Bruh, I was.
supposed to do? How am I supposed to get over there? After exploring these vast fields, the mountain biome is the next obstacle. The atmosphere vastly contrasts stylistically to fields due to its lightning, rain, and wind, radiating an overall dark and dramatic tone. This location is where moving blocks appear, making timing extremely critical. Next is the Badlands. It has a rusty desert look and contains spawners. Since spawners are orb-like collectibles that are necessary in order to progress further, if you just so happen to not find them, or you just straight up forget about them, you're out of luck because most of the time you can't continue a level until you collect all of them, which that was, that was so much fun. I... <laughs> <laughs> Besides backtracking a lot in this specific territory, since this is the first time this feature has been introduced, there's not much to this territory, and it's honestly the most boring one out of nine. Kinda like me. <laughs> From this point on, the levels start to become truly aggravating. In fact, so aggravating that the bullet points, one of the most frustrating puzzle game I've played recently, and past Savannah level three, things get really difficult, were ones that were written out of emotion as much as they were out of bad grammar. This became clear ever since the savannah desert and its tall yellow grass. Killers are first introduced here, which while being a form of shock mine, sheer regret will fill you once you accidentally come into contact with it, killing you instantly. More specifically, when you shift the level and don't notice until the very last second that there is a laser there, but you can't do anything about it because you can't cancel your actions. Thankfully, there is a way to get around the trip mines. However, I don't believe that this was a feature that the developers intended. And even though it's a risky task to even attempt to accomplish, you can actually land on the edges of the trip mine blocks, which saved my life once I learned that, honestly. Going from the yellow savanna desert to the dark green forest station, the jungle reflects a greenish hue on Jack, which is a very nice touch. Pumpers are also a touch of niceness that switch the gravity, even when you're airborne. In other words, you could call yourself an air buddy. <laughs> I don't get paid for this. You do have to worry about the amount of blocks you're traveling to commit this act, however, due to the momentum you're carrying varying on where you launch from. This element is one of the more unique ones due to its ability to shift gravity constantly, and for the most part, it's there to help you progress instead of hold you back. Further progressing, Aquatic has a peaceful underwater space field, hosting many coral, starfish, bubbles, and negators. With the negators, you can't shift when you're on that block. However, because you have the ability to unplug them, you can shift once it goes from purple to gray. Some of the time, however, it feels like that there are no plugs on any of the sides, so part of you isn't sure that if that's actually the case, since you're pretty sure you can see all the sides from all the angles that you're able to climb onto, but another part of you thinks it's the frustration you've been dealing with that's clouding your judgment. In a positive light, however, those very mental clouds could in turn be visualized as snow, which there's plenty of in the Arctic. In the Arctic, winter blocks with icicles that are decorative and that won't hurt you are spread across the map, along with multiple faders. These fader blocks fade in and out of reality, and are cued by a sound effect just before it changes, so that way you know when to make that jump. These jumps are more intense than the ones involving the moving blocks due to the fact that you have to be quicker and wait for those sound cues. When you're not putting your life in danger with way too close for comfort jumps, under all that beautiful snow is the subterranean, a rocky cave type setting. This territory houses spinners, which rotates the camera, making movement more difficult. But rotation can stop, however, if you either shift or wait for it to stop. Throughout this territory, you have a realization of feeling so accomplished and relieved once you finish a level, especially since this is the second to last territory and you've been through so much so far. But then you hit Subterrain Level 9 and frustration kicks through the door like the FBI themselves. Subterrain Level 9 is literally one of those levels where you have to go back and forth throughout the entirety of it. Mind you, this is the entire map. Do you see how big this is? This is literally the biggest map in the game and we haven't even gotten to the final territory yet. Hatred finally subsides 
once you get past Subterrain Level 9, as well as Subterrain Level 10, which isn't as difficult as Subterrain Level 9 for some reason, but regardless, you've made it to the warehouse where there's metal everywhere. One hunk of metal that is only present in this territory is the teleporter. This teleporter turns on every four seconds and is one of the most helpful ways to travel, which is a nice change of pace when half of the new elements tend to slow you down. All of these territories make very clear the slow progression of both the levels, due to multiple deaths in a singular level, the variations of the settings regarding how diverse they are, which includes color palette, tone, elements, how the developers slowly integrated the new elements as you progress, and how much of an unintentional rage game this is. It's not an intentional rage game, however, because the intent of G-Shift isn't posed as a time waster to anger, annoy, and frustrate the consumer of the product for the enjoyment and the benefit of the creator. Games like Getting Over It would be classified as an intentional rage game. Where am I going? Oh, okay, you know what? I'm done, 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 I'm done. No, I'm not done. No, I'm done. No, I swear I was done! Due to its janky controls, near impossible jumps, no checkpoints, narrator intentionally mentally jabbing you, and a literal quote from the game. While G-Shift doesn't have checkpoints, and they're both platformers, at least G-Shift's trailer doesn't convey intentional pain. I could have made something you would have liked. A game that was empowering, that would save your progress and inch you steadily forward. Instead, I must confess, this isn't nice. It sets setbacks for the ambitious. It lacks lenience, it's bracing, inhumane. I created this game for a certain kind of person. To hurt them. The longer G-Shift is played, the more breaks you have to take due to how easily you can lose your progress. G-Shift is the Dark Souls of platform. No, we're not good. no. There even came a point in the Savannah world where it was just not fun anymore. Which was the downhill point where it really gets you frustrated. Even the music itself slowly morphed into that of a slow, dripping, constant faucet. Which leads you to having to listen to your own songs and podcasts because the game songs just get so repetitive, and only ever change when you switch territories. Honestly, and I didn't write this down, but I feel like if you had two songs per territory and, and then inter-switched them, I feel like that would have been a, a good idea. But, you know, kind of late for that. While the music in each territory did eventually sound bothersome due to obvious frustration, for the most part, Caleb's Ovar did a great job at accentuating or making the overall surroundings come to life in the form of a soundtrack. During the main menu, the introductory tone we're greeted with is rather happy, which gets you excited. It establishes the mood with bass, piano, electric guitar, drums, and high synth. This leads you to believe that this is going to be a fun, cheerful game where you're not going to die a bunch of times and you're not going to get frustrated and you're not going to question your own mental sanity and your own creative endeavor. Tutorial levels start out with an intro beat. Over time, it opens up with drum, synth, and then finally an electronic instrument, signifying that this place is very technically advanced. It's got an adventurous beat and makes you feel like you're in a computer simulation. Field sympathy symbolizes the open fields that you are about to traverse. It's very cheerful, echoing the tone of the main menu's music quite well. The symphony includes high piano, slight bass, electronic elements which include synth, and strings to establish the atmosphere. Mountain Song, however, vastly contrasts what Field is going for. Song-wise, it's a slow start. But once everything kicks in, it matches the atmosphere of the area. This gets accomplished by some slow strings and piano, setting an ominous tone, which is very heavily different to the previous songs. Badlands music is a lone cowboy's anthem, in between tone-wise between the fields and the mountains audible experience, consisting of banjo twanging, drums, harmonica, piano, and occasionally even gun sounds. While field sounds happy and bouncy, and mountains sounds dark and full of depending, impending, not to shoot. Badlands musical tale is lonely yet hopeful. The Savannah Desert however, is one where the songs don't match. You've got synth, drums, piano, but the synth 
is the lead instrument. Overall, it doesn't match the atmosphere quite well. Why is it so hot? And should have been replaced with an acoustic guitar as the lead. <sighs> I gotta leave this desert, man. It's way too hot. Jungle's vibe actually matches the setting. Using metallic drums, normal drums, electric guitar, and that one instrument that I, I still don't know the name of signifies this dense and lush green setting. It also gives an inspiring yet dangerous tone. Aquatic is quite the opposite. The tone is peaceful, atmospheric, and dreamy, equipping some flowing synths, piano, acoustic guitar, and light drums. The intro to it sounds very similar to the main intro, and overall it's audibly reminiscent to an underwater world. Arctic keeps a similar tone. It chimes with its light bells, choir singing, piano, and high synth. It legitimately sounds like a winter wonderland but without all of the cliche notes that you would hear in those Christmas songs. Subterrain's groove works quite well for a space cave theme, which is basically how the setting of the subterrain was stylized, powering the music with a synth, strings, an 808 kick drum, and a snare. This techno, string-infused, empty-sounding song sounds like they didn't know what kind of instruments to use for this type of setting, yet it surprisingly works, sounding like a spy movie. Warehouse of Jam also has spy-esque music, where it makes you feel like you're on a secret mission. With the use of drums, bass, a big bell, sneaky guitar, piano, and strings make for a perfect concluding track. It's not overwhelmingly epic, since that could wear you out pretty fast. It's a good mixture of slight suspense, action, hopefulness, and determination. Considering it took a lot of determination to finish this game, some criticisms have risen along the way. While a lot of them are extremely nitpicky, there is one main concern. The story. Now don't get me wrong, I don't criticize the story itself, but rather the way it was presented. It's tough to pay attention to any of the exposition on the first playthrough, only because you're too busy reading the instructions on how to play the game. The exposition should have been occasionally in the actual levels. That way you have the ability to do both the tutorials and have an understanding of the actual storyline. But doing so at the same time, while attempting to press the right keys, make the right moves, and learn about a new element each time, it's too much. Way too much to process at once. Even with the current story system in place, where Jack wakes up on the ground, looks at his phone, reads the news about how the planet has been shattering, dad texting him for his help, and for his son to use the grab tech pack, all the dad is doing in the tutorials is basically stating the reasons for these contraptions, which makes sense for the story aspect and only happens in the tutorials. Which is fine, but even then, the key information that you actually need to understand the story is in the intro, a few select tutorials, and the outro. The few select tutorials are 1 and 9. The rest don't have that much substance story-wise, due to the fact that the dad is either basically telling you what the tutorial is already telling you, or telling you why he built his contraption, because he's so proud of it, right? Tutorial 1 reveals dad's been working on a project experiment. He's caused a massive power surge, which leads to his machine pulsating a gravitational force but can't do anything about it because he's in lockdown, which is why he messaged you, his son, who has to use the GravTech pack to help out. Since the machine his dad was building lost power due to the explosion, you have to collect power and bring it back to the warehouse. Your dad also mentions that stabilizing drives should also be collected in order to fix the machine. Tutorial 9 introduces the gravity wells. These wells are where you have to use all of the energy that you've collected thus far, as well as plug in all the devices you may find. It's also revealed that Dad doesn't message you past this point, because he's been taken by some strange people. Other criticisms that don't relate to the story are not as important, but are still noteworthy. You can't turn the music down or off, which is a 
basic function that should be established in any video game. While the map is revealed as you progress, the background of the map should be blurred, since there's too much going on that distracts from the map itself. A weird point counter thingy in the top left corner, which while not a good indicator as to what it actually affects in game, the developer himself stated that it was an arbitrary point system. The text in the tutorial looks like it was made through Snapchat, which while not a huge deal, I just thought it was kind of funny. In Aquatic, it's hard to see the red lasers with that backdrop since part of the background is red. Special blocks don't change with the environment. For example, there is no snow on the blocks even though it is clearly snowing. In Arctic 2, there is a glitch where you cannot shift gravity on one of the moving blocks. You're still able to finish the level, but it's still obnoxious. While you're looking at the overarching map, some of the orbs are easier to detect on some maps simply due to color scheme. Overall, the game contains smooth animation, but when you press the down arrow, the animation is a bit jittery. Last of all, the end scene looks like my game just froze out of nowhere, which isn't the best thing, but. Despite those criticisms, G-Shift is a good indie game. It's challenging, colorful, dynamic, and for only a dollar, you get a long puzzle game that's got a good story. It's one of those games that, despite how frustrating it can be, it can reveal a lot about you. Such an example could be that this game is a metaphor for life. It's hard and you may mess up, but when you do mess up, stop for a second and analyze the situation. Figure out what went wrong and use what you learned to move on, hopefully becoming better from it. One can learn that he or she can be easily frustrated and may tend to take it out on others when they know they shouldn't. They may learn that taking a step back helps, knowing that they're not perfect. And they'll never be, but that's okay, because deep down, they want to improve, and they want to become better people than they previously were. Special thanks to my 5 patrons who support me on Patreon. If you'd also like to support the channel, go to patreon.com slash or click the link in the description.